Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. The cicadas have arrived. See where they are emerging in Metro Detroit and why one family says they're happy they only come out once every 17 years. Grant. Macomb County trying to become a constitutional sanctuary. Coming up, what that means for gun owners, gun rights, and whether it's even legal. But we begin with the push to reopen the U.S.-Canadian border with more people vaccinated now on both sides. It's been more than a year since some Metro Detroiters have been able to cross and see their families. The northern border has been closed since March 21st, 2020, and the closure has been extended every month since then. Priya Man joins us live. And Priya, you spoke to a local doctor who really hopes things change soon because she wants to see her family. Yeah, absolutely. Folks on both sides of the border really missing their loved ones. You know, Dr. Gohal's family lives in Toronto, so they haven't been able to visit. She is an essential worker, but crossing the border is still a long and arduous process, and you have to quarantine, which is pretty difficult when you're on the front lines here. But there is hope on the horizon. We may soon see more than trucks crossing the Ambassador Bridge. You came across the border? I did, yeah. I'm so excited. When's your plan to come? It's a conversation Dr. Just Karen Gohal and her family have had every month since the pandemic began. For me, one of the main reasons I wanted to do my residency and, and work in Detroit was the proximity to the border. So it's been hard to be away from family for so long. Her mom, Jyoti Gohal, spoke to Local 4 from Toronto. She hasn't crossed the border since last March. She's a frontline worker and that makes me a bit more nervous. She's alone by herself working long hours and we can't go and see her. So uh, it's, it's been very hard. It's been very hard. But for the first time in more than a year, cautious optimism is building. With pressure mounting on both sides, Canada will likely take a phased approach to reopening as vaccinations ramp up and COVID cases decline. For us, whose loved ones are there, it's a good, good news. But still, it's a mixed feeling like we don't want to hit the fourth wave, like we have to protect ourselves and the others. When it comes to the border, Dr. Gohal says it feels like Groundhog Day, but there finally seems to be a light at the end of the tunnel. What is the first thing you're going to do when that border reopens and they can come over? Oh my God, I'm going to pack a big bag of food. <laughs> Oh my God, the day I'll find I'll pack my car and I'm going there. I can't wait. I already told her that, you know, the day it's been open, I'm coming. Yeah, they both tell me they've been FaceTiming a lot and they just can't wait to hug one another. Now, when it comes to that phased reopening, Prime Minister Trudeau has said he wants to see Canadians hit 75% vaccinated. Now, right now, about 63% of Canadians have had one dose and fewer than 10% are fully vaccinated. And the Prime Minister saying that, you know, that does lead to some issues because that's only a partial protection. When it also comes to crossing the border, there's talks about what showing proof of vaccinations will look like. As of right now, the border will remain closed until at least June 21st. Reporting live tonight, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. Yeah, okay, Priya, we appreciate it. Turning now to the latest on our coronavirus headlines that you need to know. The state reporting 318 new cases, 17 more than yesterday, along with eight more lives lost to the virus. It comes as the number of Michigan residents over the age of 16 who've received one vaccine dose is now at 60%. And the CDC will meet next Friday to discuss cases of heart inflammation in young adults following their second vaccine dose. The agency has identified more than 250 cases of myocarditis in people ages 16 to 24. 15 of them remain in the hospital. The Michigan Supreme Court is ordering the Board of Canvassers to certify a petition that would let legislators repeal a state law used by Governor Whitmer during the pandemic. The 1945 law allowed Governor Whitmer to issue pandemic orders without seeking legislative approval. In April, two Democrats on the board refused to certify the measure. The Supreme Court says the board has a clear legal duty to certify the petition. Macomb County is taking a strong stance on guns. The Board of Commissioners voted to make it a Second Amendment sanctuary county, and the move is getting mixed reactions. Grant Herms joins us live with what this means for people who live in Macomb County. Hi, Grant. Hey, well, basically, it would mean if you wanted to take a gun to walk around MTech there across the road, the sheriff would not have to follow the law and arrest you. Now, at least one expert we talked to said not so fast. 
The resolution which passed last week would make Macomb County what it's calling a constitutional sanctuary county and specifically references the Second Amendment, which gives people the right to have firearms. It would also allow the county prosecutor and sheriff to ignore laws if they thought they violated the Second Amendment. It's unclear why the commission thought they might need this. Michigan is already a very gun-friendly state. The Giffords Law Center, named after former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, who was shot during a mass shooting, gives Michigan a C on its latest report card. The commissioner behind the proposal says it came from concerned residents. So we asked a constitutional expert. What we're really saying is a political statement made on behalf of this entity for the county uh, to which they serve uh, about their feelings about gun control laws. Larry Dubin is an expert of constitutional law at Detroit Mercy. He says even if this passes the county board, it likely couldn't go further than that. The law for the entire state, not for this county that favors it and this county that's against it, and they can make uh, the decision as to who, uh, who will abide by it and who won't. Um, the, the law of the state is to be enforced by all prosecuting attorneys uh, throughout the state. Now that full vote from the county board is expected to happen on the 24th where it is expected to pass. I also talked to the sheriff today who said the board doesn't control him. He already took an oath to uphold the Constitution and he says he plans to keep it. Back to you. All right, Grant. Well, the end of the work week uh, feels a lot like the rest of it, hot and muggy. That's right. We've got Brandon in for Ben tonight, and you're not ruling out the chance of some short-lived storms tonight, right, Brandon? Yeah, I mean, we are seeing them on Storm Tracker 4 already, and sort of an outflow boundary is prompting some showers to start blowing up in Lapeer County, but especially here in Macomb County. So we've got a little activity now still between... Now and we'll say 930, maybe 10 p.m., some of the storms that we've been seeing way up in the Saginaw Midland area could still sink our way. So we'll keep that threat at least for some rain, thunder rumblers before 10 p.m. And you can see here on the computer model, it does, again, keep some showers around through 8, 9 p.m. Shouldn't be anything too crazy. We'll consider it a blessing. Con considering the drought conditions we have here, but we are also tracking some Grand Prix shower storm trouble for the weekend. We'll explain when coming up. Hey, Brandon, now to a local four news update. A man is facing charges for a dangerous police chase and crash in Wyandotte. D'Artagnan Stackhouse went before a judge charged with assault with intent to murder, fleeing from police, resisting arrest and more. He's being held with no bond. Police tried to arrest Stackhouse during an undercover drug bust, but he took off, dragging an officer. He led police on a chase before crashing into a home. The Wyandotte officer suffered extensive injuries. The Huntington Woods native being held in war-torn Myanmar remains locked up for a 19th day now. Danny Fenster is a journalist and was detained by the country's military regime as he tried to return home to Michigan. He's believed to be in a notorious prison known for holding political prisoners and has a reputation for mistreatment. Michigan Congressman Andy Levin is working on his release. He says there is no update on Danny's status, but he's promised to keep fighting. All right, well, you can hear the roar of the engines on Belle Isle. The two-day Chevrolet Detroit Grand Prix starts tomorrow, but race weekend is already underway. Today was all about practice on Free Pre Day. Detroit is hosting its first big event since the pandemic began, and you can feel the excitement from the fans as well as the drivers. Sure can, and for one driver, it will be his first time doing laps on Belle Isle. Uh, he's pretty notable. He's 45-year-old Jimmy Johnson, and this is his debut IndyCar season. Jamie Evans caught up with him recently, and she joins us live on Belle Isle, where it looks great out there. Hi, Jamie. It's a beautiful day for racing, Jason, and we're talking about Jimmy Johnson, who has a record-tying seven NASCAR Cup Series championships, 83 checkered flags. At 45, he decides to retire and try this open-wheel racing, and he says the learning curve is steep. These cars are much different than, uh, than I ever anticipated, and not, not only learning cars, but also new tracks. Jimmy Johnson is a racing veteran, but an IndyCar rookie. This season, he's competing in 13 road and street courses for Chip Ganassi Racing. What I'm finding is the performance increase in the IndyCar 
is requiring me to recalibrate my senses. So braking, turning, accelerating, I'm doing more than I ever have. And I think that I'm at the limit of the car. And then I see the lap time and realize that I'm slow, dig into the data, realize that I'm not at the potential of the car. Johnson says he's increasing his effort on and off the track and each race he's getting more confident. Detroit will be his fourth and fifth races behind the wheel of the number 48 Honda. He heard Belle Isle can be brutal. Zero margin for error. Um, and then Belle Isle has a couple of nuances to it where it's extremely rough and bouncy for inside the car. So I'm told. And then it's a race on Saturday and a race on Sunday. Racing fans know Johnson well and spotted him right away today in the paddock. He's got a huge following, hoping he finds the success he had in stock cars in open wheel racing. Johnson says he's ready to learn something new every day, and he takes the jokes from the 20 year old drivers in stride. My teammate Alex Pillow, he didn't mean to, but we were at a team dinner at the first race at Barber. And um, he just came to the discovery that I was older than his father. And he let those words come out of his mouth in front of the entire team. Yeah, so there are a lot of 20 year olds running around here driving in race cars makes me feel old as well. But as for Johnson, this is a practice round. I just checked in. He did spin out on one of these curves, these tough curves here at Belle Isle didn't hit the wall. So the hope is his car that number 48 is good to go on Saturday and Sunday. We're live tonight. JB Edmonds, local four. Yeah, that's great. All right, Jamie, you look great. The fountain looks great. It's just going to be a great weekend. I just love the new headphones. The headphones are fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. <Jamie. laughs> We've got much more ahead here on the news at six. And that includes Rod and the cicada invasion. We've heard a lot about them. Now we hear them and we see them. Cicadas. It really is noisy in the house with mm -hmm. the cicadas out there, kind of all day. So where are they and how long are they expected to stay? We'll let you know. All right, Rod, but first, it's dangerous for pilots. Michigan State Police catch a man shining a laser pointer at their chopper, and they didn't let him get away with it. 